Today we'll be talking about motion. Okay? So, let's see that out there. Motion. Uh, we, we know basically what motion is because we see it every day in our lives from the activities of uh, people moving from one place to another. We use the cars to go to transport ourselves on the highway and the trains and the airplanes. The trees swing in the wind. And uh, even the earth moving around the sun, okay, and spinning about its axis. These are all different motions. Some of them we observe, some of them take a long, we, they take so long we can't really tell. Uh, like, for example, the stars. If you are patient enough, you can see the stars moving somehow. And then, um, even in the microscopic scale, we have things like the, the electrons, okay? For example, heat and sound. Okay, they are created and produced by jostling atoms. Okay, you talk about uh, electricity. Electricity is electrons that are flowing, they are in motion, they are moving. Okay, you talk about the television, what we see on the television screen is just movement of electrons. Okay, and then even the electromagnetic waves, they travel in space that enable us to do the radio transmission and telecommunication. Okay, so motion is everywhere. Even the light that allows us to see is as a result of electrons moving in atoms. Okay, so motion is everywhere from the big scale to the small scale. Some we can observe uh, physically day by day and some others, they are microscopic. We can't really tell except by the observation of the phenomenon. Okay, so what is motion? Motion is defined as a change in position. Change in position. When your position changes, irrespective of the nature of the change, or the course of the change, or the time interval of the change, once you change position, you have moved. Now, depending on how your position has changed, we have types of motion. Okay? So, I'm going to say here, types of motion. The first one we're going to look at is the translational motion. Translational motion. Translational motion simply refers to motion along the straight line. Motion along a straight line or fairly straight path. It doesn't have to be perfectly straight. We do lots of assumptions in physics. So, for example, I walk from here to there, okay? Or you walk from one uh, side of the class to the other, okay? Or a bus travels from Logan to Salt Lake. We assume it moves in a fairly straight path, okay? So it's called translational motion. It's also called translatory motion translatory motion or linear motion or rectilinear motion they are all the same so it means somebody is moving along a straight line and as we go along we're going to discover that is the motion when we say motion in one dimension that is the motion we are talking about moving along just one line one dimension so that is what we're going to be talking about today. It's the easiest kind of motion, the simplest kind of motion. And we're going to start from the simplest kind of motion. But I'll describe all types of motion before we focus our attention on the simplest kind of motion. So translational motion is the first one, motion along the straight line, okay? Then the second one is going to be I will call this Oscillatory motion. Oscillatory motion. Oscillatory motion is the to and fro movement of an object about a mean 
position or fixed point, usually called the equilibrium position. To and fro, back and forth, about a fixed position. Examples are motion of a simple pendulum, okay, going from point A down to point B, back and forth. It's an oscillatory motion, okay? The turning fork, oscillatory motion, okay? Another name for oscillatory motion is often known as vibrational motion, okay? When you vibrate, the vibration of atoms about the mid position is also an oscillatory motion, okay? So the turning forks, the simple pendulum, Okay, even certain ways, they exhibit that nature of oscillatory motion. There are certain things you might not clearly get for now, but just get the basics. When we get to circular motion, vibrational motion, oscillatory motion, it will become clear. Okay, so that is another kind of motion, oscillatory motion. The oscillatory motion is also known as the vibrational motion or vibratory motion. Vibrational motion or vibratory motion. That's another name for this. Vibrational or vibratory. Are we good? Yeah. Awesome. Now, another kind of motion is what we call number three, circular motion. So this is the motion of a body around the path of the circumference of a circle or part of the circumference of a circle. So it's moving in a curved path which is part of a circle or moving around the whole circle. So sometimes you might just move a little bit, it is still circular motion. You don't have to go the whole circle. Sometimes you can go the whole circle several times, it is still circular motion. So when you go around the circumference, of the path of a circle about a fixed center, okay? So you go in a circle about a fixed center, be it a roundabout, or be it tying a rope and whirling something, a stone or something, okay? Or be it the fan going around, anything that goes around performs circular motion, okay? Circular motion. <laughs> okay. Now, now, I want to introduce to you something called rotational motion. And you're going to ask me, what is the difference between rotational motion and circular motion? There is a difference. It's like difference. When you move in circular motion, you as a whole is going around a circle where the center of the circle is somewhere. But when you rotate, you move in the circle where the axis, the point of the center of the circle, is about yourself. For example, this marker is going around this circle. This marker is performing circular motion. This marker is not rotating. But if I do like this, Now, the marker is rotating about a point in the marker itself. The earth goes around the sun. That is circular motion. But at the same time, the earth is spinning at about 1,000 miles per hour about an axis through itself. About an axis through itself. So the earth is spinning about itself. So it's rotating. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. It's now rotating. Now, when you have a car going around the roundabout, the car is not rotating. It's going around in circular motion. The wheels of the car are rotating about the center of the wheel. 
Do you understand? And when the car, for instance, has an accident and some assault tumbles, it rotates now because it's going in a circular orbit or a circular path, sorry, around an axis through itself. So rotational motion has some circular motion in it, but the axis is different. So when I go around the circle in an axis outside of me, I am moving in circular motion. My whole body moves in that circular motion. But when I rotate, I am spinning about myself. Do you understand? Good. And when something rotates, like a fan, okay? Let's take a fan blade, for instance. Let's say this is a fan blade rotating about the center. This part of the fan blade, this edge of the fan blade, is performing circular motion. Because this edge is going around the circle. But the whole fan is rotating. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, so if you have rotational motion, you're going to have... Circular motion as part of it. Exactly. Exactly. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. That is rotational motion. Now I'm going to bring another motion to your notice. Okay? If you need time to write something, let me know. I'll give you the time, okay? Sometimes I know I'm kind of in a hurry. Okay. I'm sorry. Always call my attention so I can uh, uh, calm down a little bit. Okay. Are we good? Yeah. Now, we'll talk about number five. Covilinear motion. Covilinear motion is a combination of curved motion and linear motion. A combination of rotational or circular and linear. You are rotating at the same time you are moving in a straight line. So an example is the galactic bodies, like the Earth, the planet. They are rotating about the sun. At the same time, the universe is expanding. They are moving away from the center of the universe. So it is curvilinear. <laughs> curvilinear. Okay, so it's a combination of curved motion and also uh, linear motion. So the rotation controls the direction and then the translation propels the body in that uh, axis of the direction. Okay, that is curvilinear. Another example, periodic motion. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> periodic motion. Periodic motion simply refers to motion that is repetitive. After some time interval, we call the period. So after some time, you come back to where you are, you start over again. After some time, you start over again. It's called periodic motion. Now, periodic motion is not particular to anybody. Anybody can have periodic motion. For example, you can have rotational motion and also periodic. For example, the spinning of the air, it takes about 1,000 miles per hour to spin, the speed at which it spins about its axis, and it takes 24 hours a day to spin once. So every 24 hours, the earth comes back to where it was, spinning about the axis. So that is rotational motion, at the same time periodic. The clock, you see the clock, okay? The clock hands, the arms of the clock are moving like this, okay? The arms of the clock are moving. So that is circular motion. But the minute hand comes back every what? 60 uh, minutes, is that not? Every 60 minutes, it comes back to, the, to that, or the hour hand, I mean, okay? You see that? So the thing is, there is a periodic motion there at the same time circular motion. The earth, the earth around the sun. The earth goes around the sun every 365 days. The earth going around the sun is circular motion. But at the same time it is periodic because it comes back to itself after 365 days. So periodic motion, oscillatory motion is periodic. 
The motion of the simple pendulum is periodic. You see that? The pendulum will go back and forth and come back after a particular interval. So periodic motion, you see, when you understand the different kinds of motion, you can put them and, you know, match them together. Is that okay? Yeah. The last kind of motion we'll talk about is what we call random motion. Random motion is half as that. Is that motion that has no direction? It is chaotic. It just goes no direction. Okay, zigzag. Like motion of smoke particles. Motion of maggots. Motion of dust particles. Okay, they have no sense of a unique direction. Okay, we call them random motion. There are people who study those motion and try to create some symmetry, some, some form of uh, um, organization from the motion. They'll tell you it looks chaotic, but there is order in that chaos. Okay? It's another branch of physics. Okay? Alright! Now, like I said earlier, we are going to focus on linear or rectilinear or translational one-dimensional motion. Okay? Good. So I'm going to start from there now. Let me wipe this up. Okay, now, we will focus on the properties or nature of motion. This is called kinematics. Later, we'll talk about the rules of motion. The rules guiding motion, the details of the equations. That is called dynamics. Now we'll discuss the properties. Acceleration, velocity, speed, okay? And then later we come to the rules, which is the dynamics. Here, I'm going to define some terms. Definition of basic terms. And these terms will help us understand motion better. And the first one I want to define is a point. A point. What is a point? A point is an abstract notation in physics and mathematics that just tells us the location of an object without having to tell us where the object is with reference to another object. I'm going to explain that. What do I mean? I have a car here. I have a house here. I have a tree here. I call this A, I call this B, I call this C. So I say the car is at point A. I don't have to tell you with respect to what. <laughs> so point A, that's where the car is. So that's it. The tree is at point B, the house is at point C. That's a point. But if I want to tell you the second definition of gradient, which is the position of an object, the position of an object, then I have to define a reference point. So a position tells you where it is with respect to something else. So it is easy for you to locate. Okay? So the next definition is the position. The position. <laughs> We are coming to the, we are getting there very soon. We are getting there to the interesting part of this. So the second is the position. So this is telling us the position is the location of an object with respect to some reference. We usually take that reference as the origin, but it depends on you. So if I have, if I have Ali here, I have Simbi here, 
and I have Alice here, and I have Bob here, okay? I can say Alice is sitting above Bob. That is the position of Alice. I've given a reference. Or I can say Alice is sitting beneath Cindy. So your choice of reference is up to you. Your reference choice is up to you. So there is no standard reference. Okay? So when you want to discuss the position of an object, this is where we talk about number three, coordinate systems. Coordinate systems gives you some set of axes. So an axis is a line along which we can measure distance or position. That's what we call an axis. And the plural is axis. Pronounced as axis. Okay. So that line is called an axis. So a coordinate system provides you a kind of formulation that you can use to locate objects and determine positions of objects. And the simplest coordinate system I'm going to call A is a number line. Just a straight line. You have the origin 0, I call O. And then you have minus 1 minus 2, minus 3, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. So I can tell you an object is at the point plus 2. You can easily locate that from the origin. An object is at the point minus 3. It's a number line. It's just one address. But it's also your choice. You can decide to say, no, I want to have my minus axis on the side, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and my plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. It's your choice. But before you do anything, define what you're doing. So you tell the person, my negative axis are to my right, and my positive axis are to my left. Yes, that's what I choose to do. <laughs> you have that freedom. Okay? But usually, conventionally, we use this other one, where we take the positive axis to the right and negative axis to the left. Another simple coordinate system is called the Cartesian. The Cartesian has two-dimensional and three-dimensional. So we'll start with two-dimensional origin. So we'll have an x-axis called the horizontal axis. And we'll have a y-axis called the vertical axis. So you have positive horizontal, negative horizontal, positive vertical, negative vertical. So if I have a point here, the position of that point, that point has axis say 2 in the x and 3 in the y. So I say 2, 3. So the point A has x component 2 and y component 3, but I said the position of A is 2,3. So I can locate A from the origin. This is another way of describing position using the Cartesian coordinates. 2,3. x, y all the time. It's always x, y. And in three dimensions, it's x, y, z. Okay. If you want to describe other things, like an ant on a ball, an ant moving on a ball, you can't use Cartesian coordinates because it's a ball. So we, we introduce what we call spherical coordinates, R theta phi. Sometimes we have cylindrical coordinates. Polar, we have crazy coordinate system, depending on what you want to describe the position. And it's very important in simplifying the dynamics. Very important. Okay. That is coordinate system. Okay, now let us discuss business. <laughs> let us discuss business. Enough of the stories, okay? Let us discuss business. Okay, now I want to define distance. I want to define distance. That's number four. What is distance? The distance between any 
two points, say A and B, is the shortest length interval in space between this point. <laughs> I want you to listen. I want you to listen to how I explain this. It's very important. I have a point A and I have a point B. I have two people. They want to walk from A to B. Alice walks from here to there to B. A distance, say, 30 meters. Bob, this Alice. Bob walks a longer distance, say, 45 meters from A to B. Are we okay? But what is the shortest interval between A and B? It's a straight line, right? Now listen. Alice has walked a distance of 30 meters from A to B. True. Bob has walked a distance of 45 meters from A to B. True. But what is the distance between A and B? It is neither the one Alice walked, nor the one Bob walked. It is the shortest line, the, the magnitude of the shortest line joining A and B. Do you understand? So the distance you walk, we understand you can walk some distance. Anybody can walk any distance. But the distance between two points is the shortest one. So the distance from here may be, say, 15 meters. That is distance. So distance is measured in meters. Distance is measured in meters. That is the SI units. The SI unit. We have other units. Kilometers, centimeters, millimeters. And by the time we start solving problems, we'll see how to convert from those units to the other. Okay. So distance is in meters. And meters, the short form is M. Okay? That's the unit for distance. Number five. We define what we call displacement. <laughs> displacement. Displacement is beautiful. Displacement. Displacement is simply distance covered in a specified direction. For example, somebody traveled north from the origin. If I say I walked 30 kilometers, or 30 kilometers. Oh, that's a long walk. Okay, let's make it a reasonable walk. <laughs> I don't want to walk 30 kilometers. Okay, let's say I walked 3 kilometers today. You are describing your distance. You are describing your what? Distance. But if I say I walked 3 kilometers from home, to the library. I've given a direction. From home to the library. But if I stop at from home, without telling you where I walk to, it is incomplete. It is still like distance. Because from home, you can walk anywhere. We want one direction. So, 20 meters north, 2 kilometers east, Okay, five meters northwest. These are examples of displacement. So it is distance plus direction. And it is measured in meters plus direction. Is that clear? That is displacement. Good. Now, 
we want to define time? Well, before I define time, let me make an example for you that will make distance and displacement clearer. Because we're going to solve some things about speed and velocity. And if you understand the difference between displacement and distance, you're going to get the, 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 the feel about speed and velocity more. Okay? Okay. Now, this guy is here. There is this guy here. He's swimming in the pool. He swam all the way there, 50 meters and swam all the way back 15 meters okay so we'll assume he went on this line and came back on the same line okay so he went from A to B and back from B to A so what is the total distance he traveled 50 plus 50 100 meters but what is his displacement zero because he from where he started, he has not moved any distance. He came back to the same place. There is no change in direction after the whole motion. Now, what if he stopped here? He went 50 meters. On his way, he stopped here 35 meters. So what is his total distance covered? 50 plus 35, 85 meters. What is the total displacement? From here, where he started, he is now here. So his displacement is 50 minus 35, 15 meters, not. That's by how much he is displaced from his original position. Do you understand? Do you understand? So if I say, calculate speed, I'm coming to speed, distance over time. If I say calculate the speed of this guy, the average speed, it will be 50 plus 35 over time. But the velocity is displacement over time. So velocity will be 15 over time. <laughs> you will not use distance for velocity. So that's the difference. We're going to come to the difference between average velocity and average speed. Is that okay? So you have to understand the difference between displacement and velocity before you can compute speed. I mean displacement and distance before you can compute speed and velocity. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Now, let's define time. What is time? We use the time every day. The time is 6 o'clock. The time is 5 o'clock. We see some questions are rather difficult. How now define time? Like, ah, what are you talking about? <laughs> we all know what time is. <laughs> Ask the clock, okay? <laughs> all right. Now, what is time? So that is definition number 6, I guess. Okay? Time is defined as... They call it the temporal interval between two events with respect to before or after. So you're talking about a temporal interval. Okay? Between two events, something happened, or oh, when did this person die? Before this person was born, or before, with respect to before or after, okay? Past six, um, before six, after six, you know, with respect to that. That's the simple definition of time. It's measured in seconds. Okay, that's the SI unit of time. So we can go to hours, you know, minutes, okay, days, years, centuries. Decades like that, you can go to other units of, uh, of time. Now, speed. That's number seven. <laughs> speed is defined as the time rate of change of distance. Time rate of change of distance. So mathematically, we say speed is equal to distance divided by time. Okay, I have people who define speed as 
the rate of change of distance with time. Okay? And then I was in high school and I had this professor tell me, oh, the rate of change of distance with time, that's how you define speed? I'm like, yeah. And he said, okay, what if the rate of change of the distance between Salt Lake and Logan from last year to this year changed from $20 to $30? I'm like, uh... I thought when you say rate, you're talking about time. Say no, rate can be money, it could be anything. <laughs> so he said, okay, it's the time rate of change of distance, okay? Not the rate of change of distance with time. <laughs> he said, okay. <laughs> All right. So with time from last year to this year, the change from Logan to Salt Lake. The rate has changed from $20 to $10. Is that speed? <laughs> okay, we have some crazy people in this universe. I'm not one of them. All right, now, <laughs> let's look at the speed. The time rate of change of distance. So the, this is what you should focus on. Speed is distance divided by time. So what is the unit of speed? Speed will have a unit of distance meters over time seconds. So this is the unit of speed. Meters over second is called meters per second. It could be written like this, or it could be written as meters second to the minus one because it's under to the minus one. So these are all units of speed. It's read as meters per second. Meters per second. Yes, I'll be. I'm from Nigeria, so we were colonized by British. So sometimes I may mix my British spelling with. Uh, in British, we spell meters R E, but in the US, we spell E R. So, in case it's, I mix them up, don't blame me, okay? You know what I'm talking about. I'll try to stick to the American uh, spelling. Okay, yes, that is speed. Speed is distance divided by what? Time. I'm going to give an example. We're going to have another session for questions and answers. We're going to have solve problems for the whole two, three hours on motion. We're going to solve problems on each topic. But while I teach, I'll give simple examples also, okay? Just so the picture gets clear. So I'm going to give an example about speed. So I say, for example, a man walks 10 meters. Okay, for five seconds, calculate his speed, calculate his what? Speed. So we say solution, what is the distance he walked? 10 meters. What is the time taken? Five seconds. So what is his speed? Distance divided by what? Time. 10 divided by 5. 2 meters per second. So that's the rate he was moving. Every second he moved 2 meters. Every second he moved 2 meters. Is that okay? How is his speed? Okay! Speed, speed, speed! <laughs> we have a lot of our speed we've not talked about. We're going gradually. Little by little, little by little. Speed, although it's quite different from velocity, but we use the notation. For distance, the notation we use for distance is S. Some people use X. The notation we use for time is always T. The notation we use for speed or velocity, which I'll come back later, is V. So if I see a symbol for speed, I say speed is distance divided by time, I could say V is S divided by T. Don't get confused. V here is still speed, okay? S is distance. Or I can say V is X divided by T. Okay, so don't get the notations mixed up. So V here can be speed, V here can be velocity. Okay, yes! <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go this way. I'm gonna explain this way and let's see how it goes. 
So before I tell you the other kinds of speed that we have, let me introduce velocity, okay? I'll introduce velocity, and then we take the side by side, this kind of average speed, average velocity, uniform speed, uniform velocity, instantaneous speed, instantaneous velocity. So after understanding both, we match both together, so it's easier that way, okay? Rather than going through average speed and then go to average velocity, average velocity, it might get a little confusing, okay? Let's match them side by side. It makes more sense when we match them side by side. Okay, side by side matching. Side by side matching of speed and velocity. Hey, zin zin in the Yes, we are coming there, we are coming there. Don't worry, by the time I finish, you'll probably understand physics better than I do. Okay, that's the aim, for you to understand physics better than I do. All right. Now, what is velocity? This should be number seven or eight. My definition. Is it eight? Eight. Okay. Okay. Eight. Thank you. Velocity. What is velocity? A city called Velo. Velocity. So I care velocity. <laughs> So velocity, okay, is time rate of change of displacement. So we say velocity is displacement divided by time. So now you already know what displacement is. So it means velocity has some direction also now. Okay, velocity has some direction also. Is that okay? Okay. Displacement divided by time. That is velocity. Distance divided by time is speed. Is that okay? Now let's go back to this problem. A man walks 10 meters for 5 seconds. Calculate his speed. We call it distance divided by the time. What if I say calculate his velocity? You will say the velocity cannot be calculated because we don't have a direction for the man. We need a direction for this distance to get a displacement before we can calculate velocity. <laughs> Do you, are you making sense from this right now? Are you making sense? But if I told you the man walks 10 meters north for 5 seconds, calculate his speed, his speed will remain like this. Calculate his velocity, it will be the same thing but north. I will add now that a direction for the displacement that now gives us the velocity. Some people will say velocity is just speed plus direction. It's not always so. For this example I gave. Now, let's look at this example. We have average speed and we have average velocity. So these are two new terms, okay? When you travel from Logan to Salt Lake City, you drive at different speeds, you slow down, you stop you. So when we say, what speed did you drive from Logan to Salt Lake City? We want one speed. You just give us an estimate, an average of what you think. Yeah, about 100 miles. Um, or, or, yeah, I drive 100 miles and I get a lot of tickets. So it's supposed to be 60 miles. I'm sorry about that. Okay, about 60 miles. Now I put myself in trouble. I don't drive 100 miles. <laughs> Okay, it's about 60 miles per hour, right? So I drove around 60 miles per hour from Logan to Salt Lake City. So sometimes you were slow, sometimes it was 10, sometimes it was more. You give an average, okay? And we know what average is. You sum all of them divided by the total. So we say average speed, average speed is defined as total distance divided by total time. So total distance covered Divide by total time taken, total distance covered, divide by total time taken. It's your average speed, okay? So I traveled from Logan to Salt Lake, a distance of say 100 miles. And the time it took me was one and a half hours. So what is my average speed? The total distance, 100 miles, over the total time, one and a half. Is that okay? That gives me my average speed in miles per hour. Is that okay now? Now, for average velocity is total displacement 
<laughs> Are you seeing the difference now? <laughs> over total time taking. Total displacement over total time taking. Because velocity is defined in terms of displacement. Now let's come to our problem. See the problem I told you before? This guy swam 50 meters this way and came back 35 meters. Okay, and he stopped from point A to point B. He stopped at point B from point A. 50 meters back 35 meters. So what is this? So let's say the time taken is 10 seconds to go from here to there. So what is his average speed? Average speed is total distance 50 plus 35 over total time 10 seconds. So that would be what? 85 over 10, 8.5 meters per second. That's his average speed. What is his average velocity? Total displacement. <laughs> total displacement. Not total distance now. Total displacement. What is his total displacement? If you remember from where he started. Here, 15 meters north. Is that not? So my average velocity will be 15 over the time is still 10. Okay? 1.5 meters per second. I will still write north. I'll put the direction there. So do you see the difference between why we cannot say that velocity is just speed plus direction? If velocity was speed plus direction, it should have been 8.5 north. But it's not. Because displacement and distance, they sometimes don't tally with each other. Is that okay? So you know the difference between average speed and average velocity. Then we have another kind of speed and velocity. Called uniform speed, uniform velocity. Okay? Uniform speed, uniform velocity. Uniform speed, uniform velocity. That's our next definition. Uniform speed. Here is the key of our time, okay? I don't, want to, I don't want to keep you here till it, it gets so boring and you're like, oh shoot, can you just let us go home now? <laughs> okay, enough of velocity and speed. <laughs> Let's go talk about some burgers and pizza or something like that, <laughs> right? Okay, less for me, I can stay here till night, okay? I don't know about you, but I can stay here till night. Okay, now let's talk about... Uniform speed Uniform velocity What do you mean by uniform speed? No, look at me. I'm going to come to acceleration, but I'm going to explain something now. I start from here, okay? And I start going like this. I move fast! My speed is increasing. Uniform speed means I go at the same space. I'm moving with only one speed. I'm not changing it. Like your cruise motion in your car, you put a cruise 60 miles, but you just stay there. You're cruising 60. Uniform speed. It's also called constant speed. Uniform speed, constant speed. Okay? Non-changing speed. So, a body is said to move with uniform speed. A body is said to move with uniform speed when it covers equal distances in equal intervals of time. That's the definition of uniform speed. Every five meters, you cover it in two seconds. Every five meters, you cover it in two seconds. Every five meters, you cover it in two seconds. So your speed is the same everywhere. So your speed is uniform. It's uniform speed. You cover equal distances in equal intervals of time. So the same velocity. Uniform velocity. You cover equal displacements in equal intervals of time. Equal displacement in equal intervals of time. Are you there? How is there? Yes, 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 yes. It's uniform velocity and uniform speed. Now. <laughs> okay. Okay.
I will briefly explain instantaneous speed and instantaneous velocity. So when we say instantaneous speed, velocity 2, it has instantaneous velocity. It means the speed at a particular time, one time. When you were on your way from Logan to Salt Lake City, at exactly 20 minutes, what was your speed? 20 minutes you should be around Brigham City. At exactly 20 minutes, what was your speed? You look at your speedometer. Oh, I was running 10 miles per hour at exactly 20 minutes. Oh, that is your instantaneous speed. The speed at a particular instant of time. So your speedometer actually gives you instantaneous speed. Every time you look at the speedometer, it tells you the speed at that particular time where you are running. Is that okay? Speedometer doesn't give you average speed. You have to calculate average speed by yourself. Okay? It just gives you a speed at a time. Is that okay? Okay. Although some of you are not very used to calculus, but I'm going to put in some calculus in here sometime, just so when you get there, or when you get problems like that. So we define instantaneous velocity as, or instantaneous speed, as the limit as delta t tends to zero of change in x over change in t, which is defined as the derivative dx dt. Don't worry, we'll start solving examples. We'll, we'll see more about this. Okay? Okay? This instantaneous speed. For instantaneous velocity, we put a vector sign here for displacement. Okay? But we will we'll, we'll see that uh, as we go along. Okay? I'll pause there for now. Let's not uh, make you guys feel dizzy. I want to go home. Okay? Yeah? Now, speed, velocity. We've been able to see average speed, average velocity, okay? Uniform speed, uniform velocity, instantaneous speed, instantaneous velocity. Now, we want to talk about just two more definitions. Only two more definitions. And then we are ready to discuss the equations of motion. We discuss the equations of motion, we discuss the graph of motion, and then we are done for the day. Okay? That's all about motion we need to know. So next time we see, we solve problems. Solve problems, we solve problems, we solve problems. Okay. Number nine. Acceleration. This is defined as the time rate of change of velocity. Time rate of change of velocity. Okay? When your velocity changes with time, you are accelerating. It is a vector quantity because we want to put a sense of direction. Sometimes we use speed with time, but velocity is more appropriate if we can give the details of the direction. Okay? So, acceleration, please let's be careful. Acceleration is also the same as average acceleration. This is where we have a slight change, unlike the others. It is the change of velocity divided by time interval. So acceleration A is V minus V naught over T, where A is acceleration I'm going to talk about rotations later. V is called the final velocity. V naught is called the initial velocity. So what is the unit of acceleration? Velocity divided by time. Velocity is in meters per second divided by time. So this is meters per second divided by time, which is meters per second. So time is seconds. So I'll just put S here to this, okay? Meters per second times 1 over seconds. So it is meters times 1 over seconds times seconds. Meters over seconds squared. So we say meters per second squared as the unit of acceleration, okay? So it is meters per second sequire 
or meters per second square like that, or ms minus 2. They are all the same thing. They use a factor. <laughs> there is something we need to understand about this acceleration, okay? Because uh, I'm going to tell you something very soon again about this acceleration. Let me give an example first before I tell you what I mean. Let's let's have an example of acceleration, okay? Example: A car's velocity changes from 10 meters per second to 20 meters per second within 5 seconds. Calculate the car's acceleration. So in this stage, you see most acceleration problems, you just write a value. They give a velocity. Most problems, when they give you velocity, they don't mind to give direction. They believe you already understand it comes with the direction. So they'll tell you the velocity of this. They won't tell you whether north or south or, you understand, they want you to just have that intuition. So just in case you have that loss of information, put it at the back of your head that there is still some direction. This. Okay? So usually I can say from 10 meters per second to 20 meters per second south. So that when you put your acceleration, you can still put the south because acceleration has to also have direction. Is that okay? But most texts, they ignore that. They believe you've already understood. So that is why some people mistake speed and velocity sometimes. Okay? All right. So what is the car's acceleration? What is V final? 20. What is V initial? 10. We started from 10 to 20. So what is the time interval? 5 seconds. So what is your acceleration? V final minus V initial over time. 20 minus 10 over 5. 10 over 5. 2 meters per second second. Is that okay? That's my acceleration. 2 meters per second second. Let me do it this way. I will use an example to explain the next concept, okay? So you get it clear. Now, I want you to do this problem for me. Tell me what you get, okay? The same problem, a car's velocity, or let's say, a car slows down from 10 meters per second to 5 meters per second in 2 seconds. Calculate the car's acceleration. So a car slows down from 10 meters per second to 5 meters per second in 2 seconds. Calculate the car's acceleration. So you have everything you need. The initial velocity is 5 meters per second, uh, 10 meters per second. The final velocity is 5 meters per second and your time is 2 seconds. So calculate for me acceleration. Do you need a calculator? No. Okay, what did you get? Oh, it would be 2.5 minus 2.5 meters per second. Okay. Minus! Acceleration can be minus! Velocity can also be minus, depending on your direction, we are coming there, but acceleration is scale what? Minus! When you have a minus acceleration, it has a different name. It is called retardation. It means you are slowing down. So normally acceleration means you are speeding up, you are accelerating. So when you are slowing down, you are also accelerating, but you are accelerating negatively. <laughs> so it's called retardation. That was the next thing I wanted to introduce you to. Retardation or deceleration. So this is negative acceleration, okay? Retardation or deceleration is negative acceleration. 
And I'm going to clear something here, okay? I'm going to clarify something here for you, okay? So when you are slowing down, when your speed is decreasing rather than increasing, you are retarding or you are decelerating. And if you calculate your acceleration, you find it's negative. Let me explain something here, some form of tautology, which is the mistake that some people make about retardation. per second to 5 meters per second in 2 seconds okay and also calculate the car's retardation calculate the car's what retardation. good not acceleration <laughs> calculate the car's what retardation hmm When you are calculating retardation, okay, you now tell them that your retardation, look at it, calculate your VI is five, uh, 10 meters per second, right? Your V final is 5 meters per second, and your time is 2 seconds, right? What is your acceleration? Not retardation, your acceleration, okay? Your acceleration is V final minus V initial over T. 5 minus 10 over 2. 5 over 2, 2 meters per second square. Negative. That's your acceleration. But what is your retardation? Your retardation is 2 meters per second square. Without the minus. Because retardation already means a negative acceleration. <laughs> so, if you are finding retardation, take out the minus sign. Because you're already telling them from that definition of retardation, it's a negative acceleration. When they say find acceleration, then the minus sign has to come there. That is a negative acceleration. By the time you say your retardation is minus 2 meters per second sequire, then it's a tautology. It's like saying minus twice. Do you get that? Okay. That is all we need to know in defining. Now I'll go straight to the equations, okay? I'll derive the equations of motion. I'll give you the notations different people use in case you see different textbooks. And then I'll introduce you to motion graphs. And I'll try to finish within the next 30, 45 minutes so we can, we can take a break, okay? Now. Am I cleaning some of the things you're supposed to write? You're good? Please let me know if I'm about to wipe out something and you want to write it, okay? I'm, I'm going to write something important about this last thing, okay? Before I move to the equations of motion, okay? I'm going to derive the equations of motion in two ways. The simple way, when you just do the algebra, and the calculus way, for those who know calculus, okay? I'll just derive them just for the benefit, and then... Uh, after that, be good to go. <clears throat> we say this is very important. It relates acceleration, speed, and velocity. It says when the acceleration of an object is in the same direction of the velocity, then the speed of the object increases with time. And vice versa, when the acceleration of an object 
is in the opposite direction of the velocity. That is when the object slows down. Okay? Then the speed of the object <coughs> decreases with time. This is very important for you to understand. Okay? So here the particle is actually accelerating and here the particle is decelerating. Okay? <clears throat> Equations of motion. So I'm going to start algebraically. So we're going to define the first equation of motion is giving us V equals V naught plus A T. That's the first equation of motion. Okay? It has different symbols. Some people call this V equals U plus A T. Some people use U as their initial speed. Some people say V final equals V initial plus A T. It doesn't matter. The denotation is the same. Okay? okay? So how do we derive this first equation of motion? Algebraically, we're going to derive it. I'll derive it algebraically. Okay, I'll try to derive everything algebraically and derive everything by calculus so we don't mix them up, okay? Now, from the definition of acceleration, this one just pops up from the definition of acceleration. So if you remember acceleration, we say acceleration A was V minus V naught over T or V final minus V initial over T, okay? So when you cross multiply, a times t is v minus v naught. So when v naught comes here, a times t plus v naught is v. So we say v equals v naught plus a t. That's just the first equation. It's just from defining acceleration. It's just the same uh, thing as that, defining acceleration. Is that okay? Now let's go to the second equation. The second equation is just the definition of average speed. The second equation says s equals u plus v over 2 times t. This is the second equation. So which you can say x minus x naught, that's how some people define the distance, difference in position, equals v naught plus v over 2 bracket t. This is another notation for it, for the second equation. Another notation for it, For the second equation of motion, it's like I did before, x final minus x initial equals v final plus v initial over 2 bracket t. All these notations are the same, saying the same thing, okay? Now, how do I derive this? It's from the definition of average speed. We say average speed is total distance divided by total time, okay? What is average speed? It's final speed plus initial speed divided by two. If we have just two speeds, okay? The initial and the final divided by two, okay? Equals total distance, which we call S over T. So when we do that, S becomes V plus V naught over two bracket T. Just that. So you can use any other notation to write it down. So, the first two equations are just from definitions that we already know. Okay? Now, let me see if I can give some examples to use these equations. Or you want us to get the all equations and then give examples to see what to use. I think it's better that way. So you know how to choose equations and how to... Okay, that's what I'm going to do. So let's go to the third equation. The third equation states that S equals UT plus half AT sequire. Which is X minus X naught. Could be Y minus Y naught depending on the vertical motion or horizontal. People use different symbols 
We're going to see them, we'll play around them as we solve problems. Equals V naught T plus half A T sequoia. This is another notation for the third equation. Or people say X final minus X initial equals V initial T plus half A T sequoia. Okay? They are all different uh, notations for the third equation. So how do we derive this? Simple. We put equation 1 into equation 2. Equation 2 says, let me use this symbol, S equals U plus V over 2 bracket T. So, and that's the second equation. So this equation 2. What of equation 1? V equals U plus A T. This was equation 1. Right? So I put 1 in 2. How? S is U plus V over 2 bracket T. This is 2. How do I put 1 in 2? Anywhere I see V, I put this, U plus A T. So it becomes S equals U plus U plus A T. That is my V over 2 bracket T. I put V with 1. Is that okay? So when I simplify that, When I simplify that, I get S equals U plus U plus A T over 2 bracket T. U plus U is 2U plus A T over 2 bracket T. So S equals T comes in 2U T plus A T squared all over 2 when I multiply this t into the bracket, okay? Then I can separate both of them into half. 2ut over 2 plus 8t squared over 2 is the same as this. Share the 2 in between them. So it becomes ut plus half 8t squared. That's my s. That's the third equation I was trying to prove. So I can write it in any notation I like. x minus x naught is v naught t plus half a t squared, or x minus xi, xf minus xi, like that. So that's how we get the third equation of motion. Okay? Now, we go to the fourth equation of motion. This is equation 3. The fourth equation of motion, equation 4, states that v sequire equals u sequire plus 2as. So we can write this as v sequoia equals v not sequoia plus 2a x minus x naught or v final sequoia is v initial sequoia plus 2a x final minus x initial. Okay? Any of these notations represent the same fourth equation of motion. Is that okay? Okay! <laughs> so now let's prove this. Algebraically, there are two ways to prove this. Okay? The first way is to take the first equation, v equals u plus a t, and square both sides of the equation. v squared equals u plus a t squared. When you square both sides, it's the same. So it's u plus a t multiplied by u plus a t. So u times u, u squared, u times a t, u a t, u times a t, u a t, a t times a t is squared, t squared. Then it becomes u squared plus 2uat plus a squared t squared. Now, let me do the rest part here because I'm going to do some magic. We'll perform some magic. Now, v squared equals u sequoia plus 2u a t plus a sequoia t sequoia that's all we have right i want to do some magic this is written as u sequoia plus 2a i bring out 2a what do i have left here u t plus half a t sequoia that's what you're going to get when you bring down 2a there's no 2 here so you have a half to kill out the 2 
And you bring down one A, you need another A to make a square there, okay? And this is what you have as equation 3, as your S. <laughs> UT plus half AT squared, okay? So it becomes V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. That's one way to get it. Another way to get it, you try this at home, is to have UT plus half AT squared, your third equation of motion, and then take your first equation of motion, that V equals U plus AT, solve for T, T will be V minus U over A. Now put T, V minus U over A inside this equation. And expand it, you will get back. That's another, it's a longer way. You can try that. Okay? Now, I'll do the calculus method of deriving the same equations. It's quite easier if you know calculus, but if you don't know calculus, it might be tough for the first time. But we get used to it as we go along, right? Now we're discussing the equations of motion using the calculus method. So we remember we have a constant acceleration. I will define acceleration as the change of velocity or the change of time, which is the VDT in differential notation, and velocity is the XT. So these are the two components that we use to produce the equations of motion. And by calculus, basically we'll get three because one of the equations is just a definition. Okay? So I'll call this equation one, and I'll call this equation two. From equation one, I get that A dt is dv. So integrating both sides, integral of A dt is equals integral of dv. So we get A t plus a constant c equals v. Now, what we do from here is we try to find the constant c from certain boundary conditions or initial conditions that we know. At t equals zero, v is initial velocity v naught. So if we take that initial condition, then it means a t plus c equals v becomes a times zero plus c equals v naught. So c is v naught. So our equation becomes v equals v naught plus a t, which is the first equation of motion. Now we go to the second equation, v equals the x dt, and we know that v dt is dx. So we put equation 2 in this equation I call equation 3. So put in 2 and 3, or let me call this, I'm going to call this, I'll call this equation, equation 3. Now, from equation 2, I know that v dt is dx. So I put 3 in 2, it becomes v0 plus at dt equals dx, because this is v, v0 plus at. Good. Then, v0 dt plus at dt equals dx. Then I integrate both sides. Integral of v0 dt plus integral of at dt equals integral of dx. Integral of v0 dt will give us v0 t. Integral of at dt is a t squared over 2 plus a constant I call c1 equals integral of x, which is x. So we take initial condition at t equals 0, x equals x0. So we get 0 plus 0 plus c1 equals x0. Then we get v0 t plus x0 plus a t squared over 2 equals x. So we say x minus x0 equals v0 t plus a t squared over 2. That's the, the third equation of motion. The second one is the definition. And to get the last equation of motion, the same thing, we go back to the acceleration, which is dv dt, we multiply by ds ds, which doesn't change anything because it's just one. And then we do, we swap this dv ds times the s dt, okay? And it becomes dv ds 
times the s dt is just our velocity v. Okay, the s here, I'm just using s here, but it's actually like x. So I could, I could just put this as x, okay, our distance that we used before as a notation. Sorry for mixing those notations. So, so the v ds times velocity v is a. This is another definition for a. So this one I will integrate that a dx, okay, okay, it's now dx. So a dx equals v dv. So I integrate both sides. We get a multiplied by x equals v squared over 2. So at t equals 0, x equals x0, and v equals v0. We use those initial conditions. Then we don't have no t here, we just have x0. So a x0 equals v0 squared over 2. So don't forget here we have a constant c2. So how do we get our constant c2? C2 is just v0 squared over 2 plus a x0. Good. Then I'm going to put this here back in the equation. Okay? It's a minus. Put that back in the equation. So I have a x plus c2 v0 squared over 2 minus a x0 equals v squared over 2. Then what do I have? Multiply by 2, 2ax plus v0 squared minus 2ax0 equals v squared. So it becomes v squared equals v0 squared plus 2ax minus x0, which is the equation of motion that we're trying to, to derive. Okay, now the next step is I'm going to take some examples on how to use these equations, okay? How to use these equations of, uh, of motion. Just some simple examples to see how to use them. Then after that, we'll, uh, we'll have a problem and problems and solution session where we are going to treat more difficult problems and see how to use the equations. So using equations of motion. I'm going to write them up. The first one, V equals V0 plus AT, V... Uh, I'll just use S for my x minus x naught. S equals V naught plus V over 2 bracket T. And then I'll use V squared equals V naught squared plus 2 AS. And I'll use S equals V naught T plus half A T squared. So I'll call this equation 1, 2, 3, and 4. How do we use these equations? I'll start with an example. Example 1. So it says... A car starts from rest and accelerates uniformly at a rate of 3 meters per second square. Okay? Calculate the final velocity. After 10 seconds. Okay, that's example one. A car starts from rest and accelerates at a rate of 3 meters per second square. Calculate the final velocity after 10 seconds. So what you do, first of all, is you write out all the parameters you are given. So don't confuse the unit. Sometimes they will not tell you it, they just tell you it moves at 3 meters per second square. So this tells you it's an acceleration from the unit. Okay? 3 meters per second square. So we have uh, acceleration is 3 meters per second square. You say square, I say square, it's the same thing. Okay? 3 meters per second square. Alright? 3 meters per second square. Alright? Then, the time taking is 10 seconds. V0 is 0 because it starts from rest. I'm looking for final velocity V. So I'll look for an equation that has all of this. V0 AT, looking for V. So the equation I need is an equation that has what I'm looking for as the only unknown. And it has every other thing known. If not, if it has two unknowns, we can use the equation. We might need a combination of equations then. We'll see some of those kind of problems. So I'm going to use equation 1. 
using 1, v is just v not t, um, v not plus a t, so which is 0 plus 10 times 3, which is just 30 meters per second, okay? Now, example 2, I will say, calculate the distance covered in example 1, Within the same time, within the same time of 10 seconds. Now, they want us to calculate distance of that same problem. So now we have A, T, V naught. Now we already got V to be 30 meters per second. Now we are looking for S, which is your X minus X naught, if you like. Okay? So we are looking for X minus X naught, or the X. So how do we get S, the distance, covered in that time? It's very easy. Physics problems, as you will see, are very easy. They're as easy as sipping a Fanta. No, if you like Fanta, just sip Fanta easily. It's the same way you solve physics problems, because they're very easy. Now, here, we're looking for S. So I need an equation that has any of these with S. This one, V not V2, I can use two. I have acceleration. I have V not, I have V. I can use S. I have V naught. I can use any of the remaining three because I have all the information. So I'm going to use all the three and we'll see if we get the same answer exactly. So using two, S is V naught plus V over two bracket T, zero plus 30 over two bracket 10. So this will give us 30 over two bracket 10, which is 15 times 10, 150 meters. Somebody else might say, no, I don't want to use this equation. I want to use another equation. Let's use equation 3. Using 3, V sequoia is V not sequoia plus 2AS. So I put V sequoia, 30 sequoia, 0 sequoia, plus 2 times acceleration is 3 times S. So 0 plus 6S, 30 sequoia is 900. Divide both sides by 6, slight constellation, balance 1 plus L all over 2, 2 member, you get S as 900 divided by 6, it still gives you 150. It doesn't matter which equation you use, so long as you have all the variables, all the parameters you require in that equation. I can also use this equation to get my S, and we'll see if we get the same answer. Because I have all the numbers, all the parameters that are in that equation. S equals V naught T plus half A T square. So V naught is zero times T plus half times A is three T square is 10 square. So it becomes zero plus three times 100 over two. That's 300 over two is 150 meters. The same answer. Any equation, any equation, the same answer. So this is, a simple illustration of how we use the equations of motion. The questions might change in the problem and answer session. We'll see more tougher problems and we'll explain to you how to tackle them. The next thing we want to do now is to discuss motion graphs, the graphs of motion. Yes, motion graphs are very important because they are a pictorial way of showing us the movement of objects or bodies. And we have basically two of them or three of them or four of them depending on how you want to describe them. I will, sh I will simplify them into four, but mostly we use just two, okay? Okay, yes. Motion graphs. So we have what we call the distance time graph. We have sometimes they call it position time graph. So don't get them mixed up. And sometimes they say displacement time graphs. Okay, 
And then sometimes they say speed time graphs. Sometimes they say velocity time graphs. Sometimes they say acceleration time graphs. Okay, okay. Now, sometimes they mix up the distance and position time graphs, okay? So, we're going to condense these two as one, okay? Distance time graph and position time graph. We take the displacement out because here we have some sense of direction. So, which is what differentiates the speed time graph and velocity time graph also, the sense of direction. So, basically, we're going to explain one, two, three, four, and maybe this one also. Now, as the names imply, from the names, as they imply, we start from the first one. And the first one is the distance time graph. Distance time graph simply means a graph of distance plotted against time. Okay? Say so distance in meters plotted against time in seconds. So in this graph, if I draw a straight line like this on this graph, okay, I call this line AB. So line AB will represent uniform speed because it gets a slope which is called the gradient, the slope of the gradient which is the change in y over change in x. In this case it's change in x over change in t. So if I get a slope here, okay, this is your change in t, your change in time from t1 to t2, and your change in s from s1 to s2. So that slope is s2 minus s1 over t2 minus t1. So you can get a negative slope, whatever you get from the value of the slope is your average speed or uniform speed because it's a straight line. Now, if it's going, say, C to D, you get a negative slope because this will be your S1 now, this will be your S2, this will be your T1, and this will be your T2. So let me call this one primes. Okay? So line CD will also give us a speed, a uniform speed, but that uniform speed is going to be negative slope. Because T2, uh, S2 is smaller than, uh, uh, S, S1 is larger than S2, or S2 is smaller than uh, S1. So in that case, the slope of line CD, the slope or gradient of line CD is S2 prime minus S1 prime over T2 prime minus T1 prime. So this is negative. So it will be a negative slope to give a negative number, and that number is also uniform speed. Okay, or average speed. If I have a straight line on this graph, I call EF. It means it's a constant distance or constant position. You are there in that position, you did not move in that position, okay? You are not accelerating, you are not moving, you are just staying in one place. Alright, so this is how a distance time graph works, okay? How do we represent acceleration on a distance time graph? So depending on if the acceleration is positive or negative, okay? We will have acceleration on a distance time graph to look like this. If the acceleration is a positive acceleration, not a retardation, it goes like that. It's still a uniform acceleration, okay? But here, you have to calculate uh, this acceleration as it goes. If it's a negative acceleration, it goes that way. We're going to solve more examples of this as we, as we go along. Okay. Now, 
let's look at the speed time graphs. Okay, all the displacement time graphs first. The displacement time graph is just similar to the distance time graphs, but in this case we have here a graph of displacement plotted against time. So the same way a straight line like this, in the distance time graph it was speed, uniform speed, here it will be uniform velocity. Because the slope will be changing displacement over changing time. So to give us a velocity, because there's a displacement. The same negative displacement uh, here, you have negative uh, velocity, I mean, at this place, and then here you have a constant displacement. The same. It's just the velocity. From speed in a distance time graph, you have velocity in a displacement time graph. That is just the difference. Now, I'm going straight to the velocity time graph, because it's not so different from the distance time graph, just the direction that is included in the displacement. The velocity time graphs is a graph of velocity in meters per second plotted against time in seconds. So a straight line here, I call AB, will have a slope of change in velocity over change in time. So that slope will give us uniform acceleration. That's uniform acceleration. And if it's a negative slope, it will give us uniform retardation. A straight line represents uniform velocity. Uniform or constant velocity. So the velocity is not changing. The particle is not accelerating. So for you to get acceleration, you have to calculate the slope. For you to get retardation, you have to calculate the slope, just the same way we did here. And we're going to take an example to show that. Okay. Now, I will give two or three basic examples, okay, of basically the velocity time graph. Let me call this example 3. I say starting from rest. Another important point is on a velocity time graph, we can calculate total distance covered. And total distance covered. is calculated as the area under the graph. We're going to give an example to show that, okay? We're going to give an example to show how to calculate the distance covered in the area under the graph for us to understand this perfectly. So sometimes the motion is triangular, sometimes the motion is a, a, a polygon, like a, a, a trapezium, or some mixture of two polygons and one triangle and a rectangle, like that. So you get the area of that and then you, you get what you want, okay? Now, starting from rest, the car accelerates uniformly until it reaches a final speed of 20 meters per second in 10 seconds. It then continues with this speed, or I can call velocity, okay, to make things easier because I want the velocity time graph. Continues with this velocity uniformly for the next 20 seconds. The brakes 
are then applied and the car slows down till it comes to rest in five seconds. Now problem one. Draw or sketch a velocity time graph of the above motion. Okay? Okay? Draw or sketch a velocity time graph of the above motion. Question two. From the graph, find the acceleration, the retardation, total distance covered, We are not done yet. Total time taken and average velocity or average speed. Let's just say average speed since we don't know. So we might not know the, the uh, direction. Okay? Okay, average speed. It's fine. Now, what we do. is we start by reading the problem. A velocity plotted against time. So this velocity v, this is time t. In seconds, velocity v, which has I label my axis. Starting from rest means starts from zero. Acceleration is a straight line until it reaches a velocity, a final velocity of 20 meters per second. So this is 20 meters per second. In 10 seconds, so the time it takes to reach there is 10. Then it continues on this speed or at this uh, velocity for the next 20 seconds. Here becomes 30, 20 plus 10, 30. And then the brakes are applied, it decelerates for the next 5 seconds. This is 35. Okay, now we said sketch the velocity time graph. We've sketched it from the graph, find the acceleration. Acceleration is the slope of this line. So acceleration A is slope of line OA, call this line OA. So which is change in velocity over change in time. So that gives us 20 minus 0 over 10 minus 0. So this is just 20 over 10, 2 meters per second. second. That's the acceleration. The next question is the retardation. Retardation is this line. So let me call this BC, okay? BC. So, retardation or deceleration is slope of line BC. Important point. Important point. An important point is when you are solving a graph problem in motion, and they say from your graph, compute something. Don't use equations. Equation of motion can solve this problem, but they want to see how you can use your graph to get those same answers, those same parameters. So it is important to know how to use graph to get slopes, to get accelerations or retardations, and how to use that to calculate even final velocities, as you see in the next example, or the total distance covered. Slope of line BC, that becomes twenty minus zero. Okay, so the final one here it actually ends at zero. So it's zero minus twenty. Okay, over thirty-five minus thirty. So it becomes minus twenty over five. So the problem here is we're gonna get a negative four meters per second squared. This is the acceleration. But the retardation, if you remember, cannot be negative. It's just 4 meters per second. Okay? That's how you calculate retardation. But the acceleration is minus 4 in that place. It's a negative acceleration. Okay?
Okay, I call it minus A. So retardation is minus A. Negative acceleration. Okay, at that point. The next question is total distance covered. So this is where we get the area under the graph. So we want the area of this whole shape formed under the graph. So there are two ways to get this, or more than two if you like. The first is to call this whole shape a trapezium and find the area of this trapezium. Or you can break it into a triangle, another triangle, and a rectangle, and sum the areas as you like. So long as you find the total area is the same, okay? Half base times height, length times width, half base times height, sum them together. Or we just say easily the area of the trapezium, total distance covered equals area under the graph. So I say area of trapezium O A B C. So which is half times the small length A B plus the long length O C times the height, which is uh, I can call um, uh, let me call it A prime O A prime. Okay, okay. O A prime is the height. All right. This is the area of a trapezium. So it's half the small length AB, which is 30 minus 20, 20, uh, 30 minus 10, I mean 20, plus the long length OC, which is 35, times OA prime, the height, which is 20. So this gives us 20 plus 25, 55 times 20 over 2 is just 550 meters. That's the total distance covered, 550 meters. So even if I've taken the area of this triangle plus the area of this rectangle plus the area of this triangle, I'll get the same thing, 550 meters. It doesn't matter. Oh. That is how we calculate total distance covered for a velocity time graph. Oh. All right. Now, I want to give another example. Now, I'm going to do another example. Just simple modifications. I call it example four. Starting from a velocity of 10 meters per second, a car accelerates uniformly at a rate of 5 meters per second square. Okay? Reaching a final velocity in 10 seconds. It then continues with this velocity uniformly for the next 20 seconds. The brakes are then applied and the car slows down until it comes to rest in 5 seconds. So every other thing in the problem is almost the same except that from the graph what we now want to find is find the final velocity The retardation, total distance covered, total time taken, and average speed. So you see how the graph is going to change now. Now we're going to draw a different graph. Now this car did not start from rest anymore. This car started from a velocity of 10 meters per second. So this is zero, let's say this is 10. And then it accelerates uniformly till it gets to a final velocity v, we don't know. But we are giving the rate of the acceleration as 5 meters per second square. But we don't know the final velocity. V. We call it V. Let me call it V. We continue at this velocity for another, this is 10 seconds. Another 20 seconds. This is 30 seconds. Before the brakes are applied and it comes to rest in 5 seconds. This is 35 seconds. So this is your time T in seconds. And this is your velocity V in meters per second. So we have a new graph. It's just a slight change. Now the first question is to sketch the graph. We've sketched it. Starting from 10, accelerates in a velocity v, we don't know, it continues v uniformly, constant velocity, and then for the next 20 seconds, comes down in 5 seconds. Okay, oh, we got the total distance covered there, we've not gotten the, uh, the, uh, the total time taken. Total time taken is 35 seconds for the first problem, it's just the last number there, and the average speed is just total distance divided by total time. Okay? over total time. So for the first problem, it's going to be 550 over 35, okay? Because we're going to do the same here. Now, 
What is the final velocity v? So we have to know that acceleration, that's the first problem, is our slope. So acceleration is given 5 meters per second squared. So what is the slope? v minus 10 over 10 minus 0. That's the change in y, v minus 10 over 10 minus 0. So this is v minus 10 over 10 is acceleration 5. So 5 equals v minus 10 over 10. So 5 times 10 is v minus 10. So v is 50 plus 10, 60 meters per second. So that's how you get that. Now, the next question is the retardation. The retardation is the same, the change from here, but now our v is now 60. So our retardation is going to be 0 minus 60 over 35 minus 30, the slope. But we're going to get a negative number which will make positive retardation or negative acceleration and leave it negative. Total distance covered is the area. The area under the graph is now different. We have two trapeziums. This one I call O, A, B, C, let me say C, D, E. So O, A, B, E is one trapezium for the total distance covered. And B, C, D, E is a different trapezium. So to get the distance covered here, we have to get the area of this trapezium plus area of that trapezium. Or you say area of this triangle, area of this triangle, area of this triangle, area of this triangle, and sum them up together like we did before. Okay, I'll leave that to you to compute. It's very easy. Then that total distance that you computed divided by total time, 35, will give you the average speed of, uh, of this whole trip. So we'll solve more examples in the, when we see uh, next. Um, but I, I can just finish this for you, for those of you that are having problems with the area of the trapezium. So area of a trapezium, we have, this is a trapezium, this is also a trapezium, this is also a trapezium. They are all different, no trapezium. So this is the short side, I call A, the long side I call B, and the height I call H. So here we have H, the short side A, the long side B, the same here, the long side B, the short side A, and H. So the area of trapezium is half A plus B times H. The short side plus the long side times the height. So that's what I did the first time. Okay? So here for this first trapezium, O, A, B, E, it will be half times the short side, 10, plus the long side, 60, times the height, 10. So that will give me 60 plus 10, 70 divided by 235 times 10, 350 meters. That's for the first part. Then for the next part, the trapezium B, C, D, E is half times the short side, 30 minus 10, 20, plus the long side, 35 minus 10, 25, times the height. The height is still 60. So it becomes 20 plus 25, 45 times 30. So you have uh, 5, 0, 13, 50 meters. Okay. So this 13, 50 meters plus 3, 50 meters is going to give you the total distance covered. Okay. And then that sum divided by 35, the total time taken is 35, you get the average speed from there. Okay.